In this panel, we're going to talk about the new urgency for green investing strategies, whether or not it's new, but continuing and rising interest in sustainable investing products. We have a great panel put together today, and I'm looking forward to hearing what they have to say. First, we have Bill Street, who is the Chief Investment Officer for Quintet Private Bank. He'll be joining us from London. We have Parag Khanna, who is the Founder and Managing Director of FutureMap. He's joining us from Singapore. Erica Karp, who is the Founder and Chief Executive Officer of Cornerstone Capital here in New York. And this panel will be moderated by Paul Sullivan, who is the Wealth Matters columnist for the New York Times. Paul? Thanks, April, for the introduction. I appreciate it. Uh, we're going to jump right into it. Given the title of this panel, uh, when it comes to sustainability, how do we transition from philanthropy to impact investing? Um, so I would suggest that, that that transformation is inclusive. We need the quantum of capital. Um, so public, private, um, we need scale, we need permanence. And I would suggest that with regard to philanthropies, um, we need them uh, to look at the endowment, we need them to look at their PRIs, and we need them uh, to consider DAFs as they move forward to be catalytic capital. That's an uh, interesting area. How, how quickly do you think we can make that, that transition more to the, the impact investing side? I think it takes time. I think it takes um, the boards and the trustees to really get on board and understand that they need to understand what their endowments are doing, which may be inconsistent with their missions. And we also need to show everyone that performance is not compromised. Financial returns are not compromised when you move towards impact. And Bill, on, on the, you know, how do you see this, Bill, on the, on the private banking side? No, absolutely. <clears throat> I think there's been a, a huge uh, shift over recent years uh, in banking and private wealth. So, I mean, looking at the, the purpose of wealth and investments. So, I think the, the demographics of wealth so have changed uh, significantly over the last few years. So you just have to look at how uh, industries and companies and small and mid cap companies have changed from the traditional industries to the sort of high tech and the entrepreneurial uh, type sectors. And this is all driven by a different generation of wealth who are incredibly motivated by the sustainable and the impact investing side of their, their wealth. Mm -hmm. And let's keep on going with that, you know, because interest in sustainable investing has been, been growing for years. Just, you know, Cap Gemini report showed that the COVID-19 pandemic only increased and higher. I mean, how will the wealth management industry uh, accommodate this, this new interest or this increased interest? Yeah, I think, uh, um, it's, you know, to the previous comment, I mean, the first thing is that investments need to be delivered in a sustainable way, but they also have to pro um, produce a risk-adjusted return that's compelling as well. And I think the industry has done a lot of work in justifying uh, and using uh, very deep research in terms of showing that actual sustainable and impact investing does actually produce longer term, better risk adjusted returns. So you can have uh, sustainable leadership in your, your portfolios. And it's probably one of the most significant uh, uh, investment thematics that hit the industry over the last few years. Um, you know, the report found that there's a stronger interest in sustainable investing in Asia. But, you know, obviously we're all in this together, wherever we live, we're, we're all sitting on the same, same planet and it all, it all kind of eventually works together. How do you think that, that influence, you know, that, that interest from Asia, how do you think that will influence sustainable investing worldwide? I'm not at all surprised that the interest in impact investing is so strong in Asia. First of all, you have the same kind of major generational change underway here as elsewhere in the world with the transfer of wealth and assets to the next generation. Also, you have a region emerging from very deep, severe poverty. In fact, there still are about 1.5 to 2 billion poor people across Asia. So in the immediate regional environment, there is a sense of obligation that one has to do something. 
I'll also add that the community expectations and even national expectations are very, very high on business leaders because let's remember that unlike in Western markets where much of the wealth is held in public equities, uh, here uh, the high net worth individuals tend to be in uh, private uh, firms, private companies, and their assets are more rooted in the real economy. So there's a number of uh, factors there converging that are pushing people to think about the impact investment. And you know, great entrepreneurs and impact investors start out with that question, what is the problem that needs to be solved? And Asians are very honest with themselves about the scale of the social challenges in the region that still are present today, even though, as the report points out, 22% of the world's uh, high net worth individuals are in the APAC region. Rog, when you see this, you know, I think about the, there, there may be this interest, but but who takes a lead? Is it, you know, it's a classic chicken and the egg. I mean, is it is it the people with the money trying to put it to work that are taking a lead? Is it the business leaders who see, you know, a, a reason for this? Or is it the, the state actors in, in certain countries where they may, you know, have a, a greater or lesser interest in, in, in driving this? What, what do you think there? It's a great question. Well, you know, when we're talking about the scale of Asia with about four and a half billion people, the simplest answer is all of the above. Let's remember we have to differentiate between those states that are already strong and wealthy with a high share of the budget devoted to social welfare. So those would be countries like Japan, like South Korea. Uh, so even though you will have a lot of philanthropy in those countries and very prominent industrialists and high net worth individuals, there's already that strong safety net. But in many countries, especially in emerging Asia, like India, Southeast Asia, that are still relatively uh, underdeveloped, certainly from a per capita income standpoint. Uh, that's where the individual uh, families and, and industrial figures and, and newly created wealthy individuals feel that they absolutely have to step up and fill certain gaps. And there you see much more of a kind of, you know, sort of two hands working in tandem. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, think, um, I, I think it's an interesting point here. Um, I think there's a unique, we're in a, a unique inflection point in time in the sort of um, evolution of sustainable impact investing. And I, I think to your point, who's, who's leading this? I think we're in an inflection point, which means that there was a lot of governmental and regulatory sort of pressures on this. But investors on the ground, as we saw on a lot of the climatic uh, initiatives that were coming pre-COVID, but now we've gone through this sort of COVID environment, this COVID shock we've had, I think everyone is resetting their expectations to build economies back better than they were before. I sit in here talking to you from London, and London has got the low, lowest carbon footprint today than it has done for over 50 years because of the way travel has been halted and how transport is moving around. And I think a lot of investors and regulators and governments are thinking, well, actually, this is a very good inflection point to actually have something good coming out of this pandemic. 